Hello everyone and welcome to this second in our series of webinars. Today I'll give you a quick introduction to Nano Imaging Services and then hand you over to our CSO, Annette Schneemann, for the main presentation and a fascinating insight into the use of electron microscopy in virus structural biology and vaccine development. Annette will then be accompanied by our co-founder and CTO, Bridget Carragher, and also our Director of Operations, Jeff Spear, for a question and answer session. Uh, feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A box you'll see it at the bottom of your screen there um, at any time. Nano Imaging Services was founded in 2007 by Bridget Carragher and Clint Potter to provide electron microscopy imaging services to the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. The company started with a, a Technite T12 microscope, which is still heavily used today. And over the last 13 years, we have success, successfully completed well over 2,000 projects for more than 200 clients um, in more than a dozen different countries worldwide. The recent growth we've seen in single particle analysis has allowed us to significantly add uh, to our infrastructure in terms of microscopes and facilities. Our first cryos was installed in 2017, and our second is actually now up and running uh, with a new K3 camera. Last month, we opened our new Boston facility with our second Glacius microscope, and we've already seen a dramatic increase in demand from local companies here. Uh, our plan is to continue to add new sites and infrastructure within strategic locations to help make electron microscopy more accessible to everyone. At NAS, we now have a range of services that covers the entire EM workflow from negative stain screening all the way through to collection of high resolution data sets. And we are continuously developing new automation and processes in-house to help improve our services. As I mentioned earlier, the main presentation today from Aneta will be about virus structural biology and vaccine research. But there are a whole range of applications that EM can be used for. In essence, anywhere there is a question about structure, EM can be a very effective tool for providing the answers. Whether you're looking for conformational changes, characterization of a binding event, structural relationships with activity, morphology of nanoparticles, all the way through to high resolution atomic maps of proteins, viruses, and small molecules. EM can be applied in numerous ways to help find a solution. We're also starting to look at new areas where structural information can give guidance in drug development. Some of these new ideas include looking at off-target effect and toxicity, uh, messenger RNA, uh, CRISPRs, and also novel boutique drug delivery systems. We are always happy to discuss and discover new applications with our clients. So if you're wondering if EM can be applied to your particular studies or just want to learn more, uh, please contact us and we can set up a meeting with our science team. At NAS, we're building a completely unique EM infrastructure. This is a network of connected facilities that provide local access to researchers with virtually unlimited capacity, but also the ability to train and learn about every, every aspect of the CryoEM workflow, both on site and online. It starts with our headquarters in San Diego. This was our first client center and is the hub from which we can support every EM application and workflow. This is followed by our second client center that we opened last month in Boston and the subject of our last webinar. And then officially launching at the end of this month is our new San Diego microscope farm, where we plan to have up to five microscopes in total and will allow us to meet the rapidly increasing demands of the EM community. In the future, we hope to be able to offer more strategically located client centers as as demand dictates, so more clients can have local access to EM. That's the end of my quick intro. So please let me introduce our main speaker today, Annette Schneemann. Annette joined NIS in 2014 following a distinguished career in virology. She was previously an associate professor in the cell and molecular biology department at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California. And her laboratory focused on the structure function analyses of virus particles using EM and crystallography. 
and ETA also oversees the day-to-day -day running of NIS and the CSO works directly with clients to help them design and implement their projects with us. Uh, Netta will be joined after the presentation by our panelists, Bridget Carriker, a co-founder of NAS and a world-renowned electron microscopist, a true pioneer in our field, and also Jeff Spear, who is our Director of Operations and an expert in EM data analysis and processing, who is also joining us from his vacation. So thank you, Jeff. Um, okay, thank you everyone, and Annetta, over to you. All right, um, give me a second here. All right, well, thank you for this nice introduction, Ben. Um, I'm delighted to present this webinar today. Um, before we dive into looking at images of viruses and vaccines, I want to give you a little bit of general uh, information and background. Um, so at Nanoimaging Services, we perform what we consider molecular transmission electron microscopy. And we image and provide structural information on a wide variety of biological nanoparticles. They include proteins, as seen here in IgM, virus particles, lipid vesicles, polymers, and many more types of particles. Now, these images that you obtain from an electron microscope are, of course, uh, represent two-dimensional projections of three-dimensional objects. And it is certainly possible to determine three-dimensional structures, but I want to emphasize that these images that you, uh, these raw images that you obtain from, obtain from the microscope with or without just a little bit of processing already uh, provide a wealth of information that is often sufficient to ask or, or address certain questions at issue. And what you can find out is the shape or a general form of your particles, certainly what the size is, the molecular architecture, whether there's conformational flexibility or not, and a whole lot more. Of course, you can determine 3D structures as well. And there are various uh, approaches to that end. The one that is mostly used is uh, referred to as single particle reconstruction, uh, increasingly cryo-electron uh, tomography, and the newest kit on the block is microelectron diffraction. This is not really an imaging modality. You use the microscope in diffraction mode and basically collect diffraction patterns. So we're not going to talk about micro ED or tomography today. Now there's two principal methods that are used to prepare um, uh, samples for microscopy. They are negative staining in which particles are embedded in a heavy metal salt. This provides very good contrast, but it also involves drying out the sample. And depending on what particle you are imaging, this can lead to collapse of structure. Um, also negative staining induces what is, pre, uh, what is referred to as preferred orientation. Um, this and the fact that the particles are embedded in a heavy metal salt really makes it very difficult to obtain 3D structures at high resolution. And it's not really a method that, or yeah, a specimen preparation method that is used for structure determination. Um, the other method is vitrification, which is used in cryo-EM. In this case, particles are embedded in vitreous ice. Vitreous meaning the uh, water molecules have had no chance to form a crystalline array because the particles are basically plunge frozen in liquid ethane, which gives the water no time to form ice crystals. The particles are trapped, therefore, in a near native condition. They're still hydrated, but arrested in a frozen state. It's a method that suffers from poor contrast, but this has been largely overcome by computational averaging and is not really a big issue anymore. Um, the, the method also maintains random orientations of your particles, and this is very important and in fact necessary, combined with a whole lot of other things, to uh, determine a structure at high resolution. So what is the analytical toolbox now for viruses and vaccine as far as electron microscopy is concerned? What questions can be uh, answered and what can you see in these images? What information can you obtain? 
So as I already indicated, you can see what the morphology of your particles is, whether they are intact or broken, what their size is, what the level of aggregation is, whether particles contain cargo or whether they're empty. You can determine particle concentration. You can see how your particles interact with an adjuvant. You can, of course, determine 2D and 3D structures. You can see how your particles interact with antibodies and you can locate and map epitopes at high resolution. So for the remainder of the webinar, what I have done is I've divided it into a series of small or short snapshots that are sort of mini case studies um, of uh, using a couple of viruses as examples to illustrate how this information is obtained. Um, so let's start with human papillomavirus. This is a virus that causes cancer, cervical cancer, oropharyngeal cancer, all kinds of head and neck cancers, and a vaccine was first developed um, based on human papillomavirus light particles by Merck in 2006. Uh, it uh, came on the market. This vaccine is called Gardasil, and a similar vaccine was also developed by GSK, and it's called Cervarix. Now, <clears throat> um, in this Current, uh, in the current Merck vaccine, there are nine different types of human papillomavirus VLPs. And it was the first vaccine that is based on bona fide virus-like particles, particles that are meant to mimic infectious variants. This um, Merck vaccine is uh, generated in yeast cells. The structural protein is expressed. It forms these capsomeres, which then uh, spontaneous, uh, spontaneously assemble into virus-like particles. And um, here are two cryo-EM images that show you two different types of uh, papilloma virus-like particles. I should point out that they're not referred to as with letters type A, type B. They really have numbers. But in this case, the labeling of these images just says type A, type B. So just ignore this. Um, so what you can see here in these images are nicely formed virus particles, uh, virus-like particles. All the protein is, seems, seems to be assembled, so this looks nice. The preparations are very pure. But what you also immediately appreciate is that there is a structural heterogeneity in these particles. They're not all of the same size. Some are small, some are a little bit bigger, some are more round, some are a little bit oval. You can also sometimes see very elongated particles. And similarly here for this type, although not quite to the same extent. Now, in a vaccine that is based on virus-like particles, size of the particles and size distribution is obviously a key attribute. And when this vaccine was in the research and development phase, it was very important um, at Merck to characterize the size distribution of these particles. And NIS was involved in this effort. So what is done at NIS, we use what we call a semi-automated particle size analysis in which an analyst actually manually traces the outline of these particles. And this is done on, can be done on several hundred particles. And these traces are then fed into a program that determines a whole bunch of data points. And they include the mean area equivalent diameter of each particle, but also uh, or oh, the area equivalent diameter of each particle and the mean for the whole population. You also obtain things like the mean uh, maximum Faraday and minimum Faraday diameter. This is for particles that are not spherical but elongated. You get a measure of the circularity, the fraction of very elongated particles, and a whole lot more. So when this was done on these two uh, examples that I showed you earlier, it turned out that these two types have very, very different size distributions, as you would have already expected just looking at the images. But more importantly, this size distribution is extremely reproducible for these types. And you know, remember, there's many more than two types in this vaccine. And this is a characteristic for each, such a curve is a characteristic for each of these types of particles. So because of this, semi-automated particle size analysis can be used as an analytical method to monitor consistency of manufacturing lots of this vaccine. And you know, any deviation from this curve can be used as an early warning sign that something might be amiss. Now, 
in addition, because this was the first type of vaccine based on virus-like particles, it was very important to know how these particles interact with an adjuvant. Um, any type of you know, subunit vaccine or any vaccine that isn't um, based on an attenuated live virus is usually administered in the presence of an adjuvant. And in this case here, it is alum. Alum is a amorphous um, you know, aluminum hydroxide phosphate sulfate mixture that forms small sort of plate-like structures and the antigen, in this case, the particles are supposed to adhere to this uh, adjuvant. And this was uh, visualized at NIS. And you can see this here in this cryo-EM image. This uh, uh, amorphous material, this electron dense material is the adjuvant. And you can see here, here's a zoom in view, these particles adhering to the adjuvant. And they appear to be perfectly intact. And this was um, confirmed by performing tomography on this and showing that even in 3D, these particles are uh, intact and they do not fall apart as they are uh, interacting with this material. You can also dissolve this adjuvant and recover the particles intact and they maintain their size distribution. So this was an important um, thing to confirm as this vaccine was developed. All right, I want to switch over now to influenza virus to illustrate to you what particles look like or how the appearance of particles can change when you image them in vitreous eyes versus negative stain. And this here is a uh, cryo-EM image of um, an, an H3N2 strain of influenza virus. And it's a very typical image of particles in vitreous eyes. What you find is that they're fairly rounded. They're not necessarily spherical, but they can be a little bit elongated or have sort of this ellipsoidal shape, but they're definitely rounded. And you can see how they are decorated densely with hemagglutinin. There's also neuraminidase in this mix. And here in the center, this is a top-down view now onto this hemagglutinin. So this is quite a typical uh, image for influenza virus in uh, by cryo-EM image. When you look at these particles in negative stain, you get quite a different impression. The particles have a bit of a sort of a crumpled appearance. And this is no doubt a consequence of the fact that these particles have been dried out. The contrast, of course, is great, much nicer than in a cryo-EM image, because you have this contrast agent here but the shape of the particle doesn't necessarily reflect what they look like in their native environment. So it's something important to keep in mind when one looks at virus particles in negative stain. Um, here, under this hemagglutinin is a lipid bilayer that you can't really see in, the, in this uh, you know, magnification, but this lipid bilayer here is now dried out and that leads to a kind of a collapse of virus particle structure. Nonetheless, you see features that are really important. Once again, the hemagglutinin here, also in the center, and even some soluble, uh, solubilized hemagglutinin here. This is also present in these cryo-EM images, but much more difficult to see. And you need more of an experienced eye to make this out. But there's these black little dots here in this image that represent the solubilized um, hemagglutinin. Now, a lot of our clients ask um, whether we can determine particle concentration for them. Determine the particle concentration of a virus sample is actually not straightforward. Unless one has a, um, an absorption coefficient, coefficient for the virus, it's almost impossible to determine. Um, infectious titer does not really represent the actual particle count, neither does, you know, something like uh, genome copies per mil in the case of AAV. So um, it's, it's a difficult thing to know, but um, electron microscopy can help in determining this. What we do to that end at NIS is we have a standard that is a suspension of latex beads at a known concentration. And this is mixed with a, an aliquot of the virus sample, which is at unknown concentration. And the mixture is then imaged in negative stain. And you can readily distinguish the beads from the virus particles. So here is one of those beads. It's perfectly round. It has a smooth surface. It is 100 nanometer in diameter. And it looks completely different from a virus particle. 
And in fact, these here are all influenza virus particles. So what an analyst then does is um, they take a bunch of these images and uh, sort these particles into two groups, uh, virus particles and beads. And they do this for a couple hundred particles. And then based on the ratio of the latex beads to the influenza or the virus particles, you can then determine the virus concentration in this particle concentration in this sample. And so that's a very popular um, method for many clients that they request. All right, let's move on to adeno-associated virus. This is a gene therapy vector that we image for many, many clients and typically image uh, in cryo, by cryo-EM. And here is a very typical image of adeno-associated virus. You'll see a lot of capsids. They're pretty nicely distributed. You can uh, tell what the size is because there's a scale bar. Um, and you find that some of the particles are dark and some of the particles are only dark in the perimeter, but light in the center. And this is actually a reflection of the presence or absence of cargo. In this case, the viral, um, yeah, the gene, not necessarily the, 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 um, the, the, the DNA, the, the, uh, yeah, the genome. Um, so an analyst can uh, take many of these images and sort particles into these two categories, empty and full, and tell the client what the ratio is of empty to full particles in this uh, sample. And that's a very important uh, piece of information for most people who work with AAV because it is very difficult to eliminate completely this uh, fraction of empty particles. You also um, see in these images that there are some particles that are not intact. Here's one with a gap. Here's a kind of a funky looking particle. Here's one that is also having a gap. And an analyst can also sort these particles, um, uh, use these categories intact and not intact to determine the fraction of particles in a sample that are not, um, yeah, that are not intact. And that combined with the fraction of particles that are empty directly, you know, correlates with potency, of course, of such a uh, sample. Um, analysts at NIS also look in these images for anything else that might be of importance. And in this case, what you can see, perhaps, uh, I hope you can see it, uh, there is some stringy material here in these images that in principle shouldn't be there. But when we see something like that, we assume that this represents nucleic acid, and in particular, in this case, probably DNA, which might have been released from these broken particles. Of course, the origin is not really clear, but that's a good first guess. Anyway, so you can see that from just looking at these images, you already obtain a lot of information. You obtain information on the size and morphology of the particles, whether you know the level of integrity, level of aggregation, presence of other material, and you can quantify the ratio of empty to full particles or intact to non-intact particles. But um, um, you can also take these images and perform some computational processing. And lately, several of our clients have asked for this. Now, the first step in computational processing is usually a process called 2D, two-dimensional classification. And in this case, a computer now uh, picks, it's called particle picking, and picks or boxes out the individual particle images and sorts them into classes where they are all self-similar. And this is done on thousands of particles, usually 10 to 20,000 at least. And you can ask for a certain number of these classes. And all the particles that go into one class in the end are averaged, and it gives you an impression of the particle with much better yeah, a higher signal to noise ratio and therefore much better definition. And this is shown here. These are 2D class averages that were obtained from this particular sample here. And um, so once again, what you see is some particles are solid, have a solid appearance. Others are looking dark inside. And this is the difference between empty and full particles. And there's other classes where the particles are empty. And you have a number here that indicates how many particles were averaged here. And so once again, you can take these numbers and arrive at a ratio of empty versus full particles. I mean, what you can also see in 2D class averages is what the surface features are of AAV. It's a pretty spiky uh, virus. 
and um, you can take more, I'd say, precise measurements because, you know, of the very well-defined uh, outline of these particles now. And depending where you take this measurement, um, from, let's say, a valley to a valley or a peak to a peak on the surface, you know, you get some slightly different uh, diameters. Also, just looking at these particles, you learn something about symmetry and, you know, it looks like six-fold, but it's our three-fold actually and uh, two-fold symmetry. Anyway, this is not such a big deal for AAV because we know it's an icosahedral particles and this is all, all well established. But if you had a virus now that was completely novel and had never been seen before, by just doing a little bit of 2D class averaging, you already learn a lot about a, uh, a new virus. Of course, you can also perform 3D classification, determine a 3D structure of this virus. And we've done it for several clients at NIS. And it's actually quite a straightforward process. You need to start out with a good quality sample. It doesn't have to be that concentrated, but it was quite an impressive image, uh, one of hundreds. Um, you perform your 2D classification and then you know uh, process this into a 3D map. And this was a virus structure that we determined at 1.8 angstrom resolution. Here is a snapshot of the cryo-EM density, uh, very well defined. This is a beta sheet and you see the individual beta strands very well defined. Here is a, you know, a amino acid side chain of tryptophan, looks really great. And overall, um, anyway, uh, a nice structure came out of this. I got to say that the structure determination of AAB is relatively straightforward because it's a structurally pretty well-defined um, particle and it has high symmetry. It has 60-fold symmetry. So that makes it relatively, it behaves well in ice too. That makes it relatively easy to determine 3D structures. All right, let's move on to subunit vaccines. When you look at subunit vaccines, you start to look at proteins now. You're not looking at whole virus particles anymore, but viral components that are the target for vaccine development. And, you know, antibodies to that particular protein will neutralize the virus. So because we're now looking at proteins and not big viruses, we almost always start with the analysis and negative stain. Because remember, negative stain gives you very good contrast. You can see small particles very well. You cannot see them very well in ice. There are other reasons uh, as well. Uh, Cryo-EM grid preparation usually is not um, a slam dunk. It requires some optimization. You need a fairly high concentration of protein. None of that is necessary in negative stain where the grid preparation is relatively routine. You can get away with very low concentrations and that combined with some 2D classification can answer a lot of questions. Um, all right, let's look at an example. So this here is, we are looking here at the fusion protein of human respiratory syncytial virus. That's a virus that causes lower respiratory tract infections in particularly young children, but also older adults, and is a, is a big um, concern and the vaccine is really necessary. So the fusion protein, the F protein, sits on the surface of the virus particle, but it occurs in a state that is metastable. It's a trimer, by the way, a homotrimer. And it, it in this pre-fusion form, is metastable. But this is the form to which you need antibodies. When the virus particles infect a cell, this protein undergoes a pretty dramatic structural rearrangement where um, it now goes into a stable state. Now, obviously, these two structures are known. These are crystal structures. And the pre-fusion form was mutagenized to stabilize it enough so that it could be crystallized and the structure solved. However, for vaccine development, the requirements are much more stringent and these proteins have to be stable over the long term. And so we um, worked with several clients on a number of samples where the question was, is the protein still in the pre-fusion form or has it converted to the post-fusion form and or something in between? And so as we, uh, as I indicated, we started out with negative stain and even in the raw images, you can immediately see that this protein is existing in a mixture, at least in this example. So you can see these elongated particles here and here that all represents the post fusion form. But there's also these smaller, more rounded particles where you think hmm, this could be the pre fusion form, but it's really difficult to tell. So what you now do is you um, pick a 
uh, 10 to 20,000 particles in perform 2D classification. And then the result is pretty obvious because these two class averages that you see here are readily distinguishable and can be assigned to either the pre-fusion form or the post-fusion form. And in fact, it is a mixture that you have here. And because you know the number of particles that go into these 2D class averages, you can report back to the client what the fraction is of particles in either form. All right. So another example that is more recent and perhaps a little bit more, yeah, it's definitely more current, is our analysis of the spike protein of the uh, SARS coronavirus 2, which is, of course, the um, causative agent for, of uh, COVID-19. This spike protein is also a trimer, and the structure was solved by cryo-EM in the laboratory of Jason McLellan, and I think here the first author is a graduate student in this lab. This was a fantastic achievement. I think they solved the structure in two weeks after the, within two weeks after the sequence of the spike protein was made available, and so it was just a quite a quite an accomplishment. Anyway, we uh, were interested in solving the structure at NIS for a variety of reasons, and so requested spike protein from various sources, including commercial vendors, and. As I said, you know, the first thing that we do is we look at proteins in negative stain to make sure its quality is um, what we need. And surprisingly, we found that all, all three preparations that we received did not look very good. In preparation one and two, there were no protein particles that had any resemblance to this sort of primaric uh, structure of the uh, spike protein. It looked unfolded or aggregated, maybe denatured. We weren't sure, but certainly surprised. In this third preparation, there were some particles where we thought, yeah, that is probably the right, you know, uh, form, what we're looking for. And 2D classification confirmed this. So in this uh, preparation, there's definitely some spike protein that has the right structure and the higher resolution structure could be overlaid onto these two class averages. And so um, this, this confirmed that at least some of the protein in this preparation is in good shape. It contains some well-defined trimers, but it's just an illustration that, you know, what you can do to quickly assess protein quality uh, in negative stain. Now, a lot of you know, groups, academic, both academic and industrial groups are now working with spike protein. And a lot of times they want to now map antibodies and find, okay, where do on the, where on the spike protein do they bind? And you can do this in negative stain by 2D classification as well. And um, I'll show you another example um, where we have done this a couple of years ago with a um, the human uh, cytomegalovirus pentamer complex. The CMV is a herpes virus that causes a lot of congenital diseases and there's also a vaccine in development and you need neutralizing antibodies against this pentamer complex. When the pentamer is a glycoprotein that also is uh, exposed on the surface of the virus, when we did this protein, when we did this project, we the structure of the pentamer was not yet known. It is now but at the time it wasn't. And we did some 2D classification on the pentamer and it looks sort of like this hook shape. Um, you know, it has this hook shape appearance. And there's a protein here that's called GH, another protein here called GL, and then there's three smaller proteins in that domain. So a total of five. And GH and GL independently can form dimers. So this client had a collection of antibodies that were neutralizing both um, from patients, but also from animals that had been immunized. And they just wanted to know where on this pentamer do these neutralizing antibodies bind. And you do these kinds of studies always with FAB fragments, not with the intact antibody, because it usually results in a messy aggregated sample. So here you can see a negative stain. It was very easy to identify the general binding site of these various antibodies. Here's one that binds to, I think this is GL, binds to GL in the pentamer two. There were lots of antibodies here, 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 and here that bind to slightly different positions in domain one and another one here binding to position two or one to position three. So this is a very facile method to quickly map location of antibody binding sites. Of course, not an epitope at high resolution, but you definitely can sort your antibodies into different groups.
Now, you can, of course, also map epitopes at high uh, resolution, but then you have to do this in uh, by cryo-EM and collect, you know, extensive data sets on a high-end microscope. And we did this in one project where a client was interested in mapping an epitope on poliovirus. Poliovirus is a virus that naturally occurs as, you know, full particles and empty particles. And the FAB fragments were mixed into the virus preparation. And what was interesting here was that the FAB actually only bound to the full particles, not the empty particles. And that in and of itself was interesting. But um, it's, it's okay to have a mixture like this in a sample because the uh, 3D processing will sort this out and give you the structure of the particle that you're really interested in. So lots of data were collected here and the structure was solved at 2.7 angstrom. And you can see that on the 60 symmetrically equivalent positions on the virus particle, the FAB has bound. And the, what's, very, what's very common with FABs is that only the, the variable part of the FAB that is in contact with the epitope is still ordered at high resolution, whereas the rest of it becomes disordered. Um, so here's just a snapshot of the cryo-EM map, and it was very straightforward to model the, um, yeah, the, the, the uh, structure of the various uh, um, capsid proteins into these maps, into the map, and then also into the FAB map. And so there you have it at high resolution, and you can map your epitope in uh, significant detail now. Um, all right, so I want to just illustrate one other thing before we, um, before we end. There is a new sort of um, yeah, development in the vaccine field that um, aims to use, instead of proteins for immunization, nucleic acids. These are called nucleic acid-based vaccines, and in particular, it's RNAs, self-amplifying RNAs. The idea is instead of you know, um, immunizing an individual with a protein is to deliver the RNA that encodes that protein, you deliver it intracellularly and have the cell make that protein. And that I think is a brilliant idea and I hope it'll work. Um, there is no vaccine on the market yet that is based on this uh, idea, but there's certainly a lot in research and development now and including, you know, vaccines against COVID-19. But so how do you deliver these RNAs? They're typically um, packaged in a lipid nanoparticle. And there's great interest in visualizing these particles and learning something about their structure. Uh, I was a little bit limited in what I can show you because most of it is highly confidential. But here is one image that gives you an impression of what these particles look like. So the, because they're lipid particles, they're all imaged uh, by cryo-EM. And you can see here an example, clients have the typical questions. What is the morphology of these particles? What is their size distribution? They have a tendency actually to stick to the carbon around the holes over which you image. They can also be very difficult to image because a lot of the um, preparations contain uh, sucrose, which kills contrast in an image that is already suffering from low contrast. But uh, nonetheless, you can uh, visualize some of the ultrastructure of these particles. And here are two examples. So many of these particles have a lipid bilayer, and then the RNA has a pretty, um, yeah, an interesting internal organization. You can see these circular concentric rings here. And what this uh, is in many cases is actually concentric uh, closely opposed lipid bilayers where, oops, sorry, the, um, the RNA is sandwiched in between. And then there is a core here in the center that apparently is composed of yeah, disorganized uh, lipids. Um, but these are features that clients are very interested in seeing. They need to know um, how their RNA is um, yeah, arranged inside these vesicles, whether their preparations are reproducible and uh, yeah, and so on. These particles tend to be quite radiation sensitive. You can see this here. There are these white spots. That's a sign of radiation damage, and they often suffer immediately when they are exposed to the electron beam. And we're not quite sure why that is, but it's something that is uh, fairly common.
All right, so with this, I think I'm going to end. I have throughout this webinar indicated the source of the images. Um, and I had several clients, however, who've given me permission to use um, the data and images without them being in the public domain. Um, I was very uh, grateful for this permission. These clients want to remain anonymous, but I would like to thank them nonetheless. And uh, I think with that, I'll turn it over to our panel now. Sorry. Right. You're back, Annetta. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Okay, we've had some great uh, questions come in during the session. Um, so we can start with, I think, maybe some considerations of when you should choose to use negative stain versus cryo, and maybe comment as well on some of the impacts in terms of structural features or integrity of using one versus the other, depending on the particle type. Yeah, so negative staining, as I indicated, is a good way of starting out when you work with proteins. So small proteins are quite difficult to see in the in vitreous ice, and you're certainly not going to see the features that you see in negative stain. So that is uh, by default, something that we do by default. And when it comes to intact or just virus particles, then you could say, hmm, we could start out in ice right away because these particles are very big and because they are so big, they can be easily um, detected even in vitreous ice. Now, the um, feature, so there is, there is a, there's another distinction that I didn't go into when you look at particles in ice versus stain. Because you use stain, you, virtually eliminate the ability of seeing internal features of particles. And that's because you have covered the virus now or particle with the stain and it, the images basically show you a replica of that stain over the, uh, over the particle. In ice, however, that is not the case and you see internal features. So for instance, uh, many virus particles have a lipid envelope with glycoproteins in it, a very highly organized interior ribonucleoprotein, for instance, in raptoviruses. You see all these features in, in ice, but not necessarily in stain. So it depends a little bit on what the question is, what, what a client needs to see and what their uh, ultimate goal is with this imaging analysis. Can Maybe. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Bridget. I was just gonna add, and and Neda and the entire ops team works very closely with our clients to figure out what their questions are um, and then advises them, you know, as to what they might yeah. be best to use. So that, that, that's an ongoing process, you know, at all stages through the project. Mm -hmm. I guess we should add that if the structure of the particle is mainly the lipid and it's, you know, sensitive to any of these kind of conditions, then we immediately use cryo methods that, you mm -hmm. know, literally freeze the structure of the specimen instantly and preserve its structure as it would be in, in solution. Great. Um, are there any limitations to the types of viruses that can be studied by electron microscopy, either at low resolution or high? I don't think so. You know, virus particles were the first types of particles that were imaged in an electron microscope when it was developed. So they lent themselves to imaging because they are big and they have oftentimes, not always, highly symmetrical features. Um, I don't think there are any limits to visualizing Mars particles in, a, in by electron microscopy, but like we just discussed, you know, you have to think about what method you want to use and um, um, what, what the question really is. Now, as far as viruses go, you know, they can be benign or they can be highly infectious and very dangerous. And I think that is the limitation. Um, we are limited to looking at viruses that are at the, you know, BSL2 level, anything above that, BSL3 and certainly BSL4, that is not something we can image here. Switching over to epitope mapping uh, and thinking about protein-based antigens, how well should somebody understand their antigen structurally? How, what are sort of considerations around the preparation? 
um, in order to have kind of a, a very nice clean image since you had highlighted particularly with the spike protein that some of those can be quite messy which would make you know adding a fab uh, decoration difficult. Um, what are some of the best practices or recommendations there? I'll let Jeff answer that. Because oh, okay. Jeff high resolution structure determination. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I guess the thing to start with is, you know, sample purity and structural homogeneity. So you should characterize your sample as much as possible in terms of the conditions that will allow it to preserve its structure throughout, you know, your purification process. And then also through our imaging process, which can sometimes include uh, some high dilutions of maybe your original sample. So if it's a complex or you already have uh, an antigen or an FEB bound, you want that to be as high an affinity complex as possible so that it doesn't uh, dissociate under dilution conditions and, and these kind of considerations. Is it possible to image, this one's just come in, viral proteins within this native cellular environment or what are sort of the restrictions when we want to look at high resolution work at, uh, at nanoimaging? So we don't image any cell sections or tissue sections. That is not something that is part of our offerings. Um, in principle, that is possible. That would have to involve tomography for the most part. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Bridget uh, address that because they probably see a lot more of this in their academic lab. Yes, it's a great question. And of course, everybody would like to do this, but it's still very much in the research lab, I would say this is not something we could do, you know, that you can do quickly or easily. It's beautifully done when it is done in, in about a dozen or so academic labs and NIH is building new centers to do this. We'll be one of those um, in New York. But I, I would say it's not something that biopharma and biotech are going to easily get to right now. It would be a massive research project you know, involving months and months and months of work. Thinking about AAB, um, you know, we do a lot of characterization there. What are some of the benefits, particularly in using cryo-EM um, and in identifying internal features, uh, partially filled capsets, uh, sort of getting into the nitty gritty of things? Yeah, that is a good question. So AAV um, doesn't segregate nicely into just empty and full particles. There is always a fraction of particles that are considered partially full, and that is a big. That's a big. Um, um, yeah, that's 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 somebody that everybody's interested in what the fraction of the partially full particles is, and that is really really difficult to determine without really doing some processing. And you know, ultimately, if you really want to do this right and get the right number, you would probably have to process the particles into a 3D structure, do 3D classification to sort the particles into the empty ones, the partially full ones, and the uh, partially full and the full ones. So that can be done, but it's, it's, it becomes increasingly more involved. So just looking at the raw images it is virtually possible to say with confidence whether a particle is empty or maybe partially full or, or not. So many clients ask us to do this and we are hesitant because we worry that this becomes a little bit biased and that you really need to do some processing to find that out um, with more accuracy. Yeah, I guess I can add that, you know, uh, we have done many uh, types of trials with automated methods and the one thing we always run into is, you know, how do you calibrate? these methods. So somebody would have to give you like an saying a 100% full capsid sample in order to calibrate all your methods this way. And these types of samples just aren't available. One that's just come in is electron microscopy routinely done for quality control of viral particles and vaccines. Uh, does everybody do it? Is it just a few? Do we have a sense of, of how popular it is getting into later stages? Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, I I do not really know how to answer is is it done with all viruses? I don't know what all the viruses are that people, you know, uh, develop into, let's say, uh, some sort of a product, but certainly it's done a lot for AAV. It's done a lot for um, it's done 
a lot of it is done at the research and development stage when uh, groups get going with characterizing, characterizing a virus that they want to develop into, let's say, a gene, some sort of gene uh, delivery agent. It's not just AAV, it can be other, other viruses. And I think, I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head, I'm not sure, that there is a lot going on in the research and development stage and that that tapers off as you know, this this program moves into let's say other subsequent downstream phases. Um, as I as I indicated for this vaccine, this Gardasil vaccine, the electron microscopy remains an important analytical tool for current manufacturing lots. Um, I don't know how common that is. I'll just add a little thing to that. Um, we do, though, see at every stage of the drug development pipeline. I mean, we see it at the early stage where people just want to understand what they've got. We see it at the scale-up stage where they want to know as they're scaling up, are they still making the same thing? And we sometimes still see things at manufacturing. If, if manufacturing runs into a problem, they see something that doesn't make sense, they'll ship that to us so that we can do forensics. I always like to call it forensics and trying to understand what is going wrong. So we still see it across the whole board. But I would say at the manufacturing stage, they're using it more as a forensic tool to figure out the problem. Then they're using it on as a, as a QC tool, you know, for every single batch. They use much cheaper, much more high throughput methods for those batch QCs. Great, and I think we've got time for one or two more questions. So one that was submitted in advance actually was asking about novel antibodies and characterizing antibodies and antibody-like proteins. And when we sort of do characterization work, what are the types of features they can expect to understand? Um, there are, you know, and obviously we've got some interesting publications of, of fairly rare antibodies or less commonly studied ones on our, uh, on our website. Yeah, so we actually look at antibodies quite, quite a lot. And these are not anymore your typical IgGs, let's say, you know, your typical Y-shaped antibody. A lot of it now is uh, engineered antibodies with new domains on them, both on the FAB arms or the FC arm. And because antibodies are highly flexible molecules, we do not look at them in ice. We always look at them by negative stain with pre-declassification. Now, what do you get out of that? You firstly, and this is um, often quite surprising to our clients, when they have these highly engineered antibodies, they make sort of schematic diagrams of what that should look like. But because the uh, antibody itself and the new domains that are on there are often uh, added with flexible linkers, they have shapes and forms that are completely different from what the client thought they would look like. Now, that in and of itself is interesting to see in what sometimes, sometimes that explains why these antibodies are not functioning the way they should, because they have contorted in a way where one new domain is now in contact with another domain on that same antibody, and it's not available, let's say, to bind to an antigen. So there's some interesting things that can be found out. Also, you can find out about the high degree of flexibility of the antibody. This is something that um, is quite, quite it comes out of these 2D classification al analyses, the, the high level of flexibility of these molecules. And I think to wrap up, we've had a couple of questions about sample requirements, uh, and also one that I think we can combine with particle size requirements. So how small of a particle can we look at? How small of a feature can we see? And if I am a researcher sitting at sitting in my lab or almost in my lab these days um, with you know some AABs or something that we'd like to submit, what are kind of the where do we get started? How much do I need, and what can I hope to see? Um, I'll let Jeff. I'll let Jeff answer that. I'll give you. A trying to remember the whole question now. <laughs> <laughs> how small long. can it be? How much do I need, and how do I get it to you? <laughs> okay. So I think in terms of uh, a particle count, we're looking at about 10 to the 13th particles per mil as a good starting point, and we could potentially uh, use less. Uh, it'll be dilute and it's not as efficient, but we, we could do that. So how small a particle can we see? EM can actually see very small things, but when we're talking about biological specimens at low contrast, you know, we're probably looking, you know, uh, 100 kilodaltons is usually a good safe starting uh, size. 
Uh, we could potentially look at FABs with you know small antigens on them and things like this. Uh, we can resolve features like that. And if there's small changes, you know, we can get down to you know just a few nanometers in in resolution in terms of structural features on maybe larger particles that you can see, such as spike proteins, differences in spike proteins, lipid bilayers, and, and features like this. Did yeah. That cover it? <laughs> yeah. Well, just to add to that, you know, the particle concentration that dep depends a little bit on what the size of the particle is, of course. With AAV in particular, there is usually an issue that the particles stick to the carbon surrounding the holes on the grid where you actually do the imaging, and most of the particles are not in these holes. So the recommendation, therefore, is to send the um, preparation at a fairly high concentration so that that carbon once it's saturated the rest of the particles go into the holes so 10 to the 13th seems rather high and that is not always necessary but as far as AAB goes that is what we recommend I, I think one of the questions also was how do we ship it to you in whatever form it's happiest you know at room temperature on dry ice uh, on uh, wet mm -hmm. ice we take it from anywhere in the world, all over the world, and there's pa you know, packages coming in all the time. And you know, we, we carefully monitor the condition of the package when it arrives, and then work with the client again, always working closely with the client to find out what suits your protein best. You know, where is your sample happiest, and trying to you know, keep that chain of happiness going <laughs> through the whole process. Fantastic. And I think that's a, a great segue to thank everyone for being here today. I uh, would really like to encourage you all to reach out, contact us, speak directly with Aneta, Jeff, Bridget, anybody on our, on our science or you know, commercial team. We're here too sometimes. Um, but you can pretty much, you know, we, we want to talk to you about your projects, uh, see where we can help go to our website, uh, and you can also all expect a copy of the recording uh, early next week as well for this to share with your colleagues. Um, so feel free to ask any questions and we hope to see you at the end of the month as we open our cryos farm in San Diego. So thanks everyone and have a great evening.